Um, hi, everyone. I'm Melanie Schlosser. I am the community facilitator for the Library Publishing Coalition, uh, and I work for the Educopia Institute. Um, and I am here to welcome you all to the 2021 Library Publishing Forum. Um, I have just a few quick uh, opening remarks. Um, first, the obligatory thank yous. Um, thank you to our wonderful program committee, Justin Gonder, the chair, Robin Biedenboe, Sonia Betts, Jason Bazar, AJ Boston, Jane Buggle, Lauren Collister, Joanna Metz, Dave Shearer, and Regina Raboyne. Um, a huge thank you to Educopia staff, Nancy Adams, Hannah Ballard, and Caitlin Perry for doing the lion's share of the logistical planning. Um, and thank you to Brandon, April, and Hannah Wong for helping out during the week. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we love our sponsors. Uh, check them out on Sketch, um, and also definitely come to the sponsor hall tomorrow. Uh, and finally, thank you uh, to our keynotes and our invited plenary speakers. You will get to meet Elaine in just a second, uh, but check out Sketch to see what we have lined up for the rest of the week. Um, I'm about to mention a bunch of things that have links associated with them. Uh, so the program committee will drop those in chat. They are also in the emails that went out to you last week, in the daily emails that are going to you this week, and in the information archive session in Sketch that is pinned to the top of the schedule. Um, first, uh, we'll be turning on or we'll turn on the auto transcription function in Zoom so you can have captioning um, if that is something that is helpful for you. Um, there's a button at the bottom of the page that is CC slash live transcript. Um, so if, let us know if you have any trouble, but you should be able to use that to get transcripts. Um, and then, so for our links, code of conduct, uh, please make sure that you are familiar with the Library Publishing Coalition's code of conduct. Uh, we are also doing for the first time a demographic survey of forum attendees. Um, you will keep seeing this link throughout the week. Please, please do fill it out. Um, it is optional, but it is going to be very helpful for us um, in our diversity and inclusion work going forward. Um, Lots of social networking activities this week. If you haven't yet signed up for the Discord server, um, we'll be dropping a sign up link uh, in chat. Um, that is where all of the social stuff, including the meetups, is happening. And it's also an easy way to reach the program committee if you have questions or concerns. Um, we have official meetups, uh, including uh, an opening happy hour with Elaine, our opening keynote uh, this evening at 5.30 Eastern. So um, check out Sketch for the schedule on those and join us for them in Discord itself. Um, I also want to put in one more pitch for the Research Interests Match Program, um, which is something that's run by the LPC Research Committee. Uh, for those of you who are doing research or are interested in doing research and want to find um, partners and people who have similar research interests, there's a form you can fill out. There's a happy hour you can go to. It's going to be great. Um, and then I want to give a an advance thank you to our friends at University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University. Um, they were meant to host an in-person forum this year, um, but have been very flexible uh, and have agreed to move it to next year. So we are going to hopefully have uh, an in-person forum next year, next May in Pittsburgh. Um, and there is a happy hour on Thursday where you can learn more about Pittsburgh and get excited for that. Um, I believe that is all of my welcoming remarks. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're Sorry we can't see you in person, but we are very excited to have you here for the Library Publishing Forum. So I'm now going to hand it off to Robin to introduce our keynote speaker. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual Library Publishing Forum keynote address. Uh, we're going to ask that if you have any questions, you use the Q&A function there. Uh, you'll see it along the bottom of your window. You type your questions in there, and uh, at the end of the talk, I will read some of them to our very special guest. And our very special guest today is Elaine Westbrooks. She is Vice Provost of University Libraries and University Librarian at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her talk today is titled, Inequity in Scholarly Communication, 
engaging societies and their researchers in a new sustainable future. Since nobody came here to listen to me talk, I will hand it directly over to you, Elaine. Take it away. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm just really honored to be here. I wanna thank the Program Steering Committee, the Library Publishing Forum, Educopia, Melanie, um, Robin. Thank you for this invitation. Um, the work of this organization, um, the Library Publishing Forum is really important. So I am delighted that I have a chance to share some of my ideas with, um, with many of you um, this, this uh, afternoon. So I'm going to share my screen so you can uh, do, 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 do. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, so like I would say like many of you, I have been thinking about um, scholarly communication for a long time. I, I am not as knowledgeable about as many of you are in, with, when it comes to scholarly communications and the nuts and bolts. But as a university librarian, um, I have learned a lot <laughs> about um, how important this ecosystem is. And it's also, of course, been very apparent how deeply inequitable the system is. And so when you take a, a look at how important scholarly communications um, as a ecosystem is to the future of libraries and to the future of uh, democracy, uh, higher education, bettering society, improving the lives of human beings. I mean, this is a critical feature and it is very broke right now. And all of you know about that. So I'm gonna jump right in and just talk about my aha moment that led me to this idea of thinking about inequity and reckoning on one hand and then um, societies on the other. So the first was in, um, was when we signed a transfer, transformative agreement with Sage Publishing. And so this was back in October of 2019. And if you recall in 2019, end of 2018, this was when this whole idea of these transformative agreements um, had emerged, or read and publish is another word to use it. And, um, like many of you, you know, I was really suspicious <laughs> of these agreements, but um, I had a really good relationship with SAGE. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill is a very big social sciences institution. And so not only um, has the university had a big um, ongoing relationship with SAGE, so did the Odom Institute, which is a social science um, institute, um, had very deep co connections with SAGE. I thought um, compared to the other big publishers, Sage would be a very good partner. They would be collaborative. I could trust them and we could sit down and actually do something different. And those things that I thought at the very beginning actually became true um, throughout the process. And we've been working with them for two years and they have been very um, collaborative. And I would say that my experience working with them my experience working with some other publishers, I mean, there's just no comparison. But essentially, we went down the path where we said, well, let's convert up to 64 titles um, in our Sage subscription so that instead of paying the subscription dollars, we're going to use that money to pay for the APCs. And so the APCs went from $3,000 to $500. And so if you take 2,500 multiplied times 64 titles, that would be essentially the cost of our subscription. And so um, this was something that was really excited. We wanted the post prints to be deposited in the institutional repository. And then we were going along really nicely. And then we were hit with this big um, challenge, which is of the 1,400 titles we were looking at in this deal, there were approximately 400 of them that were uh, managed by societies um, through SAGE, right? And so we realized that we had two different kinds of organizations we had to work with. And we really wanted rights retention. Like we wanted UNC authors to be able to keep the rights, that that was the default, that they would not have to transfer their rights when they publish with SAGE. And I thought we were going to be able to get that to work. Um, but then 
we learn that a lot of the societies are not set up that way. And, um, and it required a really important um, time for us to step back and say, okay, what's going on here? So that was, that was my first aha moment, trying to sign a transformative agreement and just realizing that societies are just, they're just on a different level than working with them, than working with a big publisher. And so that's the first thing is when you talk about, and I, I couldn't help it, but I'm a big Snowfall fan. And I don't know if any of you watch Snowfall, um, waiting for next season, but it was just one of those things I just never even thought about societies when we started down this path. And it never came up when we, um, when other universities like the University of California system was talking about it or MIT, it just never came up. So I was just really surprised about that. The second aha moment I had was, um, back in uh, December of 2019. So I don't know if many of you remember this because, you know, of course this pandemic, you know, like last year was basically 2019. <laughs> um, I don't count 2020 as a year in my life given how horrible it was with this pandemic. Um, but you, you might remember that there's this big rumor about this White House executive order. And so I actually had like, reporters calling me and saying, hey, what's, do you know what's going on? And I was like, I don't know what's going on. So of course, the first person I called was Heather Joseph, because I was like, Heather must know, like she's at Spark, she, she knows everything. She didn't know. And so this executive order came down that basically said that there was going to be a mandate to, um, for open access. And so if it was, if your uh, article was funded um, by government funding, NSF, NIH, it needs to be open. And so what was interesting about this was of course, this just panic in a lot of arenas. And of course, one arena where there was a lot of panic was in the government agencies themselves. And so the NSF, the NIH, all these organizations were not in favor of this executive order. And what they were in favor of was sitting back studying and understanding the consequences of this executive order. Um, and so it was signed by you know, all the people who are affiliated with the, um, whether it's um, the NSF, uh, the Secretary of Defense, all these people really signed on and said, hey, let's pump the brakes. Um, the second really interesting thing that happened was um, these letters were being drafted and um, long letters basically saying, look, the, the sky is going to fall. The world's going to end as we know it. Oh my God, we can't do this. And, and so the usual suspects we saw were Elsevier, Wiley, McMillan, um, AAP. Um, those are ones you would definitely expect to being resistant to any kind of change that might disrupt their stronghold on um, academic publishing. But then when I looked at the list, and there were basically two big lists. Um, I saw the American Geophysical Union, University of Chicago Press, American Chemical Society, which might not be a surprise to you. And then the Genetic Society, Society of America. And you're wondering, well, well, who cares about the Genetic Society of America? Well, I do because <laughs> the president of the Genetic Society of America is a colleague of mine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's also the vice chancellor for research. So, so when I saw that this society signed on, and, and I just have to tell you, when I went through my Elsevier negotiations, the person I had with me in this meeting was the vice chancellor for research. And so he was one of the scratchiest, scariest people you ever want to meet. And he basically told Elsevier, I don't like you. We don't like you. <laughs> And, and I was like, whoa, dude, like bring it down a notch. But he was amazing. And so when I had my Elsevier negotiations, I invited faculty from the social sciences, the chair of the faculty, the vice chancellor for research. I had a lot of great partners, but he really stood out. And so here I have someone who sat in with a meeting, sat in with me in a meeting with Elsevier, and he signed the same letter that Elsevier signs. He was on the same side as Elsevier. And so of course I, I immediately called him and I said, look, we got to talk. Like, do you realize you're on the same side as Elsevier and just, you know, and you just told me the other day how much you disliked Elsevier. And so he was just like, well, you know, Elaine, like 
this is going to kill us. We're not going to survive. And so I said, okay, I get that, but let's have a conversation. And that conversation actually didn't end the way I thought it would. Like he really just dug in. Um, and so that was the second aha moment because, you know, for my, for the most of my career, I just, you know, I didn't give a lot of thought to these societies. When I was at the um, Cornell University Libraries, I did a lot of work with Euclid, Project Euclid and the metadata. And so I was a little bit familiar with these mathematical societies, but I really just didn't think of them as this partner that I really needed to understand and engage. And the, the focus was always on Springer, Wiley, Elsevier, Sage, and Tavon Francis. And so they're dominating scholarly publishing, they're dominating my budgets. And it was just something like, you know, that was just a known, even the provost at my university, he could talk to you about Elsevier. So I thought that it was really important for us to, of course, um, go toe to toe with these companies as much as we can, the big five. But then I also knew that there was something else that needed to be get, to get done. And so in um, April of last year, right around the, as the pandemic is unfolding, um, we broke our big deal with Elsevier. And so I had a lot of experience working with this company and trying to figure out what it is we're, we're going to do with them. We had a $2.6 million deal. Um, and now it's about a one and a half million dollar deal. And we'll probably continue to whittle and whittle away that deal because the content is just so expensive and we can't afford it any longer. Okay, so going back to this whole, you know, the aha moment about these societies, um, it became very clear that societies are struggling and that they're problematic. And I have to make sure you understand the struggling component that they are, trying to figure out ways to survive. And so I started to think about, well, you know, the mission of societies and mission of libraries is actually not mutually exclusive. There's definitely some overlap and we're both mission-driven organizations. We're typically nonprofit, although there are some societies and organizations that are not nonprofit. Um, and then a lot of the societies feel that they are an indelible part of research and a support system for academics. And I actually think of libraries as that as well, is we are the infrastructure for research. We enable scholarship, we make it possible for our scholars to push the frontiers of knowledge because we um, centralize the infrastructure for access to knowledge and information. And of course, we support um, the disciplines. Um, that's, a, that's an important part of our mission. And um, sorry, I'm scrolling my notes here. Um, so what was really interesting in that conversation with the vice chancellor, when he basically said, look, I can't sign on to this open access. This is going to destroy us. You know, there, it became like this societies versus libraries dynamic which is never going to serve anybody but the big five, <laughs> you know? So um, I saw that um, societies are increasingly aligning themselves with these publishers um, because it's a lucrative deal for them. Um, I also saw that these interests were being di um, diametri diametrically opposed, which I think is actually not going to help us in any way. And so, pitting librarians against researchers is just a losing proposition. So we have to get away from that. The other thing was um, we, all of our universities or most of our universities have these government relations teams. And so I was gung ho. I wanted to um, go to the government relations and then talk to my Senator who happens to be Tom Tillis and basically say, hey, this university is in support of this executive order. And, um, but we couldn't do it because we did not have consensus on our campus as to whether or not this executive order was a good thing. And so we couldn't do it. And that was a missed opportunity. Now, of course it died down. Uh, we have a new president and um, people have moved on, but um, it's really important that when you have these opportunities to weigh in, that you take those opportunities to work with government relations. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that a lot of the funding that goes to societies, of course, comes from the library, 
um, which comes from the provost, which comes from the state. And then a lot of the money that's funding the societies comes from the state, which comes from the provost, which trickles down to the researchers, which goes to the societies. So we have this linked future um, with the funding sources because we're generally funded the same. The other thing that was pretty clear is that we both have unsustainable models, <laughs> societies and libraries together. We, I do not have a sustainable budget. I have a you know, million dollars worth of inflation every year that I don't know how I'm going to pay for um, in perpetuity. And then of course the society business models are um, particularly in this COVID environment are precarious to say the least. Okay, so, so I just kind of talked about how did I start thinking about these societies and, and what they mean um, for me as a, as a library director giving millions of dollars for, to pay for knowledge. And then of course I have to talk about the racial reckoning. Um, in May of last year, you know, we were all at home dealing um, with this pandemic. And then of course, the um, murder of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, this um, United States, the campuses, the world was awakened with this um, horrible incident that really has mobilized many of us. And, and it really was a wake up call for us to um, revisit all these things that we claim we value. We claimed as libraries, we value diversity, equity, inclusion. And the reality was, well, we like to talk about it, but we really were not invested in dismantling the systems that were harmful. And so um, the focus on addressing systemic racism is new. Um, this is the wake up call we all needed. And, um, and a lot of institutions have issued some kind of statement talking about whether it's the movement for black lives, um, anti-black racism, um, statements that have spanned all different spectrums um, regarding um, police brutality, all these different things. And so I just wanted to share with you that societies were some of the organizations that issued statements. And so this is the um, Association of Historians um, that has issued this statement. Uh, we had a statement from uh, ACLS, which is um, Association of, what's the C stand for? I can't remember, and Learned Societies um, issued a statement. And of course, I know you were asking, what about the herpetologist? <laughs> well, this herpetologist issued a statement um, as well. And then we, of course, the Society of American Archivists, um, they issued a statement. And even my alma mater, the University of Pittsburgh, the Chancellor um, Gallagher issued a statement. I issued a statement. So this is a moment where everybody was just taken aback by, by what was happening in the world. And I think the challenge of course is not what these statements say, but what we're actually going to do. Because for many, it's a performance. These statements are just as empty and they and have no intention of doing the work to dismantle systemic racism. So what is our responsibility as a library publishing unit to address systemic racism, um, to address oppression? Um, we have to be anti-racist and anti-oppression uh, based, uh, we have to be committed to analyzing the systems that perpetuate uh, racism and other forms of oppression. And then the main question is, are we equipped as publishers? Now, of course, we have li we're libraries and most of us are affiliated with libraries, but as publishers, there's a whole system there that needs to be interrogated. And that's something that I've been thinking about quite a bit. So going back to societies, I went off to talk about the racial reckoning. Um, one of the things I had the, the fortune to be a part of was the Associated, Association of Research Libraries is based in Washington, D.C. And that's where the bulk of associations and societies are based. 
And so they've had a series of meetings with society leadership. And I had a lot of opportunities to go to DC before the pandemic and have conversations with the editors and the leadership of these societies. Um, and it was tremendously enlightening. Lightning. I did not know that much about societies, how they operate, the economics of them, their um, stress points, their how they function and operate. And I've been learning ever since. I mean, it was just a great opportunity. Uh, it, it helped me develop some empathy and understanding about um, their goal and mission and how they go about their work. And I think that aside from the Association of Research Libraries, we need more platforms to understand how societies work and vice versa. The societies don't know a lot about libraries. They really don't. They don't know how we operate. They don't know how, um, how libraries have changed. And so working with associations like research um, ARL, or I mean, there are lots of others that could be playing a bigger role in bridging the gap between societies and libraries. Um, the other thing is just how do you get started? And so I started working with the societies on the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, campus. And so, as I mentioned before, we're a really big social sciences um, organization. And so there are several that are based at the university. And so I um, identified some of those and we'll talk about how that happens because it's not easy to know what societies are out there. Um, and then I went to identify who, um, what faculty on the campus actually have leadership roles and, and are they president of the association like the vice chancellor are they, you know, what are the roles that they have because they're the influencers that you need to work with. Uh, the other thing is, um, I started inviting the reps to the library. And so uh, I have a faculty board and um, one of the political science faculty had told me that the, uh, um, the American Political Science Society or whatever that's called, that the, um, some of the leadership of that society, they come and visit the chairs of all of these departments. So all the political science department chairs get a visit almost every year. And I was like, wow, I had no idea. And so I um, started to work with the faculty and the, the organization societies to say, hey, next time you're on campus, come by the library, let's talk. Um, I also had um, the first society to reach out to me actually was um, Stacy Burke, who works for the American Physiological Society. And it's like out of the blue and she wanted to talk agreements and things like that. And I give Stacy a lot of credit because she, um, she came to campus and lots of times people come to UNC, NC State and Duke. And, um, and she actually sat in on our town halls. And so ever since we had Stacy on board, I've always tried to get someone from the society, someone from the press, get researchers, library staff and administrators in the room to talk about this Scali communications ecosystem and what's wrong with it. And having her in the room and having the press in the room, um, like we have a statewide press called University of North Carolina Press, having them in the room was transformational. I would definitely recommend it. Okay, so what are the challenges of this process? Well, the biggest one was um, the lack of understanding. And this is really a two-way street. I'll talk about the researchers first. The economics, are not well understood. Most people who are part of an association, if you think about a society you belong to, you don't know what the, the economic situation is. You don't know why the membership cost is a certain amount. You don't know why a conference costs a certain amount. You don't even know how the pricing is done for your journal. Let's take ACRL, for example. So it's, it's not, we shouldn't necessarily expect research to know all these things, um, but that is just one of the things that creates the problems that we have is there's just a lack of understanding. Um, there's a lack of understanding about the deep inequities. Now, of course, the publishers have some carrots and sticks, but at the end of the day, it's researchers who are complicit and create the inequities. They're the ones to do the peer review. 
They're the ones that write the article. They're the ones that sustain a deeply inequitable system. I mentioned earlier, they don't understand that libraries are different than when they were in graduate school. <laughs> we are very different in the way we fund, the way we operate. Um, they don't understand the constraints of library budgets. And I think the other part is there's a tendency to have some competition when the reality is we have to be focused on efficacy and building coalitions with these societies and not competing with them. Okay, now I'm so glad that um, Caitlin Thaney will be talking with you at the end of this week because the biggest problem working with the societies is the infrastructure. And what I wanna say is the societies I've been working with largely have been very small. And I'm talking about societies with under 5,000 members. I mean, those are that's a small society. Um, they don't understand the options for infrastructure. They don't have programmers and developers. Um, they don't understand the metadata. They don't understand how to pick the tools. They don't believe there are a lot of tools at their disposal. And they don't understand how um, important having a sustainable infrastructure is to the operations of their publishing arm. Okay, so disruption. Uh, COVID is the biggest disruptor we can ask for. So just having this conference, like I would love to be back in my hometown in Pittsburgh right now, but we're all on Zoom and it's because of this pandemic and this will completely disrupt the business model for this organization. The money that would have been brought in for the registration is no longer part of the model anymore. And it's not clear to me that all these organizations are gonna go back to face-to-face -to -face conferences. The other thing I think is really important is companies like Elsevier and other companies are going to find a way to fill that vacuum. They are going to find a way to develop conference systems and, and they're gonna figure out a way to monetize this remote conference. That's what Elsevier does. That's what Springer and Wiley do. And not just them, there are other companies that are trying to figure out how can we exploit this? So the money that is not going into the uh, society because we don't have face-to-face -face meetings, how can I get my hands on that money? What service can I spin up? And how can I create a lucrative service for these societies that will benefit these corporations and companies and not necessarily societies. So that's a whole nother talk, but this is an emerging area that we all need to be looking out for. Um, the other thing I'll mention is um, just the, the sustainability of the journal subscriptions. Um, we all know that typically the largest revenue that a society gets is from its publications. It's from journal subscriptions that I pay. That is their largest revenue. And I know that there are a lot of societies whose goal is to just increase that revenue stream and to build it and to build it and to grow and to self-preserve. And that is deeply problematic. And I've had to say many times when I touch base with these um, societies is, if your number one priority is to publish that journal, you're no longer a society, you become a publisher. And, and if you become a publisher, this is a whole different game. Um, the other part I would say is um, number five is we need to decide what communities we, we need to support. It used to be a foregone conclusion and, and don't get me wrong, societies produce great scholarship. There's no question about that. However, we're at the point now where a lot of the members are questioning whether or not they should be in societies. And we have to question are we willing to align ourselves with societies and particularly those that don't align with our values? And so there's this idea that there's this exceptionalism about societies, that they must exist, they're inherently good, and they are inherently um, great organizations for the discipline, for higher ed, and for society. And I would have to say that is actually not true. They are not inherently good. They have a purpose. And um, I would argue that there are way too many societies out there that are not focused on their disciplines and helping um, the researchers be better researchers, helping graduate students socialize into the field. 
Um, and the final part I just have to say is I have to go back to infrastructure. This is a major challenge that we have. So the second set of disruptors I would like to say is um, we have to question the funding models. And one of the things that I've been doing is having conversations with the provost and the vice chancellor for research about funding the societies. And so I'm actually interested in flipping the model and saying, why am I paying for these subscriptions? Perhaps we could come up with a different system where um, the provost is dedicating a certain amount of money to help fund the society. And so this is actually, I'll talk about a little bit later, but I'm considering this a different kind of transformative service um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. Of course, number two, I put an asterisk here because this to me is all about what our publishing um, services are, what the Library Publishing Forum has been um, looking at for many years is the new library service that we're creating to support um, scholarly communications, whether it's institutional repository, hosting journals, all those services we provide are um, growing among many institutions. And this is a direct result of some of the problems and disruptors I've already talked about. The other thing that is pretty clear is that the library's relationship with societies and vice versa has been really one of vendor client. We write the checks, <laughs> they take the checks and they take the extra revenue to fund prizes, scholarships, events, all the things that they need to run their um, society. And we need to shift to a um, value-driven partnership where we focus on what's important to us and how do we work together um, so that we both benefit. Um, I would say that this growth imperative is extremely damaging. Uh, libraries, we, we love to just add services and we can't support them. <laughs> we cannot. There's only so many people in our organization who have the time to do this work. Um, the budgets are constrained. Societies are the same. When I went to that meeting in DC and met with, with a lot of societies, many of them talked about those meetings where they're just trying to come up with new journals just to create more money. You know, well, let's create this, you know, we, we have a premier journal and then they create another journal for all the titles and articles that don't get into the premier journal. And so then they pitched this, the second layer journal. And, and then they said that they wanted to make sure it was open access because they felt they could make more money on open access titles. I mean, it was just, it was completely shocking that I, I heard these conversations. And it's always about, we need to grow. That's what we're here for is we have to grow. And, and it doesn't matter what the outcomes or consequences of this growth. The final part is that societies need more reckoning. I mean, they issued statements, but societies are largely white spaces. Societies are governed and managed by um, mid-career and senior faculty and researchers who are typically white men. They control the resources, they control the space, and they dictate the terms. And a lot of these early career researchers aren't having it. They don't want to be under the white gaze. They want to be in more inclusive and diverse organizations and they want equity to be seriously addressed. Okay, so quantifying library supportive societies. And so I have about four societies I'm working with right now at UNC Chapel Hill. And um, I can't give you the names of them, but I can at least tell you I have one in the two in the social sciences, one in the arts and humanities, and then a science one I'm talking with now. And I think the most important thing is the um, data. What kind of data um, can I get to? And so when I work with SAGE, what was really beautiful about SAGE is they gave us all the data. They told us all the societies, they told us all the faculty, where they publish, how much they publish. SAGE was amazing. When I work with another publisher um, from the Netherlands that will remain nameless, they, would, they really didn't want to give us a lot of information, but SAGE was awesome. They gave us so much. 
Um, we also dug into our uh, research information systems. We use academic analytics and I've been working with them to collect more data about societies so that we can understand what societies are researchers are members of, and particularly which ones are located at UNC Chapel Hill. And then the societies, of course, have a lot of data. Um, one of the most interesting things, though, is that a lot of the societies and, and universities included don't collect data on like demographic data, um, racial data. And so when they're trying to understand whether or not their peer review system is equitable or um, inclusive, they don't know the racial makeup of the people who are submitting titles. Now, gender has been recorded fairly well because you know, 20 years ago, a lot of these societies, a lot of um, these organizations realized they had a gender problem, particularly in the sciences. And so they're very much focused on what, um, whether or not women were getting grants and at what extent they were getting grants and how big the grants are. So they started collecting that. And so you can't really measure what you don't see and, and so I believe that um, collecting more demographic data is gonna be very helpful. And then as far as the service provision, I haven't gotten to this very, haven't gotten very far at UNC Chapel Hill, but I really wanna understand how much is the, the infrastructure costing us? So for the societies that we support and the, inf so we have an institutional repository what is the cost of that? What's the staffing cost? And what are the operating costs for that? And if we were providing services specifically for societies, what are those costs? What are those services? How do they line up? What's the value of them? And so as I work with the societies, the number one thing is really about our values and principles. And I spend a lot of months talking about this. Like this is the first part is a lot of societies claim they want to be equitable, yet they have a lot of policies that don't create equity at all. Um, the other part is I get a lot of emails and someone says, oh, you know what, Elaine, we're about to sign our publishing agreement with Wiley next week. Can you come in and just kind of help us look at that? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I need more than a week. Like this is a major decision. This is something that I can talk to you about the next contract. But if you're just, if, if you're committed to signing this contract, you want all the money that Wiley's gonna promise you, like, I can't help you. And so I really stress that you have to work on a long game. And if you think the only time they wanna pull you in is when the contract's about to be signed or when they, oftentimes I get calls about the APCs. They're like, oh, we're thinking about up in the APC $750. What, what do you think about that? And I meet with them and talk through the issues and they're just like, wow, this is, this is really complicated. Um, so making sure that this is not a fix that's gonna happen overnight. Um, and you gotta have the data with you as you're having these conversations. And so I, I tell the society, I wanna know everything about your society's finances. I wanna know particularly about your publishing arm. How do you fund it? How many full-time staff, all those things. I have made them get this information and then we sit down and we can compare and I can talk about how much is costing the library and they can talk about how much the society is putting into it. Four, I just wanna stress the university press. Um, not all of us have a university press, but I have access to UNC press and those people are amazing. They have a journal program. Um, John Scherer, his team is amazing. Um, there's just a lot of great people that I work with because lots of times that's the best answer is go to the university press. And Duke University Press also has a major, major um, program. All right. Um, the other part is I am starting to set the specs for a tool to facilitate this work, a tool to capture the data, a tool to look at um, investments and costs. And then also I wanna look at um, the uh, OA as a strategy in this, um, in this whole process. So the whole point of this is we have to interrogate the business models with the societies. The idea that they're just gonna grow, the idea that COVID was just a, a blip, it's just a bump on the road, they're gonna go back to everything the way it was before 
is not a good assumption to make. We have to understand where is the money going to come from in the unforeseeable future. And we have to understand what are the other things, what, what are we not doing that we have to start doing to put us in a position to be much more sustainable and successful. And that's a very difficult conversation um, to have. Okay, so, um, so what I mentioned before was this transformational agreement. And what I'm thinking about is, is there a way where I could take the money that I had been allocating to societies and literally transform that into services that I believe would, would be much more valuable to the societies than just writing a check for their journal. And so we've been having this ongoing conversation about um, the diverse and sustainable funding sources. And so I've already mentioned, I believe the Office of Research is a funding source. I believe that, um, that the societies have to find revenue sources uh, beyond the research library and beyond the publishers. <laughs> a lot of publishers finance a lot of the conferences that we have um, and a lot of tech companies as well. And so we've been really just trying to think out the box as to what we could do I'm um, talking about fundraising, endowments. I mean, all these kinds of things have to be discussed. And there's some societies that have endowments. Um, and so if we were to get out of the subscription business and focus on the services, what would they look like, right? And then the other conversation we had is how do we do this equitably? Because we all know that if we claim that we wanna be reckoning, we claim we wanna focus on diversity and we do it with a white supremacy lens, like we do it with hierarchy, we do it with perfection, we do it in these ways that we know are not equitable. Like you can't um, say you're going to do this work and then do it in the way that you've always done it. You have to come up with different ways like, like appreciative inquiry and liberating structures to come to conclusions that are very different. Number four, um, you have to leverage the library expertise. A lot of these societies and the faculty on our campuses, they don't have the expertise in metadata, data, or information technology. And so they are floating around in the wilderness and we have been able to come in and provide them a lot of information they just didn't know. Um, open is a strategy. One of the societies I'm working with has already has an open journal, but it is hanging on by a thread, right? They have a tremendous amount of graduate students running it. And they just keep, every year they literally are, um, you know, this close to, to um, folding. Um, and so we, I focus on open as a strategy and not just saying, oh, we just love open access. Open access is not free. So we have to figure out ways to support it um, in the long haul. And then number six, I've had to have some difficult conversations to say, maybe, maybe your job is to get yourself out of a job. Maybe your job, is to not publish this journal anymore. <laughs> because if, if you've been hanging on by a thread for 15 years, are you sure that this journal needs to exist? Instead of self-preservation, maybe you should be thinking about the impact that you can have. And if you cannot have a desirable impact, maybe you should not exist. And I think it's really complicated. Like one of my colleagues, um, again, he's in poli sci and he's basically saying my, my society, I mean, they got like 15 full-time staff. Those people aren't gonna set up a system that gets rid of their jobs. And I'm like, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a conflict of interest. So these are the, those are those difficult conversations that have to happen. So my final thoughts are, um, you know, I've been having these conversations with four different societies trying to figure out how we can change the model so that they don't depend on me for their survival. First, how do we change the ecosystem that is deeply inequitable, whether it's the, the metrics that we use to look at quality, peer review, the cost structures, the whole system is rotten, right? And it's important that we know how each system is deeply inequitable and be able to have deep conversations with faculty because it is very surprising how little they know. 
I mean, I could break down peer review and why it is such a deeply inequitable system and how is it that retractions are at all time high. This COVID, a lot of this COVID research that's coming out, there's a lot of good stuff. There's a lot of junk too. So we have to understand the system and what's wrong with it and build the equity into it. Um, the work that I'm doing is, does not scale very well. I'm dealing with four societies, <laughs> right? And that is something that I'm really interested in. This is a, a research area of mine, but that is not going to scale very well and to really create some transformational change. Now it's transformational for these societies we're working with and those titles they're struggling to support, but I cannot say I have a model that is really gonna save us. It's not gonna save you, it's not gonna save me, but it's something that I think we have to try. Um, the third point I wanna make is there's a lot of traps and suckers choices you can make. And you just have to be careful about that. Um, again, the one big trap is we must exist and we must survive. No, you don't. Sometimes you need to fold. Um, I, one of the traps is, well, the library, we have to support this society. We have to support these scholars. No, you don't. Those days are over. Harvard can't support everybody. It is, it, I no, no longer see my job as the, the number one's responsibility of having to buy all this research just in case people need it. It's no longer the case. And then of course, one size does not fit all. And so the work I'm doing at UNC Chapel Hill is gonna be very different at the University of Pittsburgh or at the University of Tennessee and all these other great other institutions. It's just a very different um, platform. It depends on the discipline. It depends on the level of access. I happen to have really good access to data and good relationships with these editors and these folks, um, but that is, it takes time. And I imagine for the next 10 years, I'm gonna be still working on this. So I am going to end there and take what questions you have. I'll stop sharing now. All right, <clears throat> sorry there, it took me a second to find my video.